Good afternoon, everyone. I'm thrilled to uh, welcome all of you to a really terrific event we have lined up uh, for you, the American Grant Strategy Program. I'm thrilled to be able to have joining us my colleague, Matt Peralt uh, from Duke University, uh, formerly with Facebook and an expert on technology and policy. Uh, and our guest today is a Duke alumnus, uh, Brad Wigman, class of 88, if I have that right. And uh, Brad has had a really distinguished career uh, as, a, as an attorney in, um, in the federal government, uh, agencies spanning from uh, the Department of Defense, National Security Council, State Department, and he's currently a senior uh, counsel in the National Security Division at the Justice Department. And I'll just say the usual disclaimer, uh, disclaimer that Brad is uh, uh, expressing his own views today and not the official ones of uh, his employer, the, the Department of Justice. Uh, Brad, uh, welcome to virtual Duke University. Well, thanks so much for having me. I look forward to, uh, to chatting with you guys today. So our uh, plan for this afternoon, uh, Brad is really, he, he's done work in so many different areas. I think virtually any question relating to national security law, he'll have something to, to say about. Uh, but our plan is to focus on some of the issues at the intersection of technology and, and national security. And uh, I think I'm gonna start off with a couple of questions that really are heavy on the security and how it involves technology. And then I think Matt is going to follow up on some real technology po uh, uh, policy questions that have a lot of national security uh, implications. And after a while of our uh, moderated chat with Brad, uh, we'll open it up for questions. So please uh, prepare those. You can send a question, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Beth and Bo, uh, in the chat. And uh, if, you're, if your question is selected, I'll, I'll call on you to then you'll be able to unmute and ask your question. That will be like the latter third uh, of our program. So uh, let's dive into it. Um, Brad, as you know, I am uh, very interested in questions relating to uh, uh, terrorism and how um, both on the international side, uh, but of course all of us are interested in uh, what happened at the Capitol and the rise of uh, domestic terrorism in the United States and really what the government, the Justice Department uh, should and could, as well as the private sector, could and should be uh, doing about it. So I want to ask a question about international terrorism to kind of start us off, because I think some of the some of those issues help us understand what we can and cannot do uh, domestically. So if I might, I, I go back to um, the Obama administration, which I know you served at uh, in, and when ISIS was at the height of its power, there were really uh, very deep concerns about uh, its capability to spread its message. Uh, really, it started very uh, mostly on Twitter uh, and just had a massive network which was able to send messages starting from, from the uh, ISIS headquarters areas, its caliphate, but then really rapidly spreading throughout uh, the Middle East and, and Europe. Uh, and part of the administration's announced strategy was to work with tech companies to essentially try to get Twitter, uh, get ISIS off of these uh, platforms and limit uh, their abilities uh, to use these uh, uh, capabilities, uh, big tech platforms, uh, to spread its message, to spread terrorist-related content, and so on. And I'd like to know, uh, from your experience, from a legal perspective, how do you do? How would you interact with the tech companies to try to achieve that? And are there kind of problematic legal or constitutional issues uh, that you have to have in mind when the government is essentially trying to lean on tech companies to what's essentially engage in a form of content regulation on their platforms? So that's a good question. Um, you know, the FBI is the principal player in this area along to a lesser extent with DHS. So they have established relationships with the major tech companies uh, social media companies, et cetera. And it's a kind of a two-way street where they exchange information back and forth uh, that, that they uh, see, uh, depending on what it is. Um, uh, you're right that uh, previous administrations and throughout a, a number of administrations, um, the government has 
um, jawboned, I guess I would say, with the tech companies to uh, to try to address uh, date, what we think is dangerous content online. Um, but you're also right that there are some uh, legal constraints in this area, principally arising from the First Amendment. In other words, the government can't require tech companies to take down content that we find it may lead to radicalization or recruitment. Uh, a classic example would be, uh, you know, the Christchurch video when there was the attack in, in New Zealand was kind of, uh, people were putting that up in real time after the attack. And obviously that was a hugely negative thing. And, and I think a very short time after that attack occurred, the uh, tech companies uh, took, that, uh, took that video down of that attack. Um, but they did that on a voluntary um, basis. Um, based on their own terms of service. All the companies have terms of service that prescribe, uh, you know, hate speech, violent conduct, other types of inappropriate or offensive activity. And so what the government's role is in this area is to, uh, can be, and, and the US government's not alone in doing this, by the way, the UK government and other governments around the world do the same thing, flag content for the companies so that they will, and, and they, they can on their own initiative and voluntarily consistent with their terms of service, take down content that we think is problematic. Um, and so the companies have been pretty good about doing this. I think increasingly, at least the large companies have dedicated a lot of resources to doing this. They've actually set up a whole consortium of companies called the GIF CT. I can't remember what the name of it is exactly, what the acronym stands for exactly, but it's Global Internet Forum for Counting Terrorism, I think is what it stands for. And so they have a whole program set up whereby they exchange best practices for how to eliminate terrorist content online and um, how to actually work with smaller companies that don't have as much experience in this area in, in doing the same thing. So there's quite a lot that goes on in this area, but you're right that from a First Amendment perspective, it's all kind of voluntary and cooperative, not uh, coercive. Because if we cross that line into pressuring the companies or coercing them into doing it, then we run into First Amendment issues. Even if the government uh, declares that this is a, a particular matter of national security and a particular Twitter or let's say platform user uh, is a member of a group that's on a foreign terrorist organization, no legal authority for the government to essentially uh, insist or demand that a particular individual uh, be uh, deplatformed? So if it's First Amendment protected speech, we could not uh, we could not insist that that uh, platform be taken down. Now, if it's let's say it's a, a, a specially designated global terrorist or uh, uh, Hamas or Hezbollah or ISIS sets up their own uh, website or Twitter account, yeah, sure, we could we could do that because otherwise the company would be arguably providing material support to terrorism, and the company surely would would take that down. I don't think we've necessarily had a problem with that, but if it was it was someone who was designated as a terrorist and they were knowingly providing support to that, uh, to that person or entity and getting out their message, they would have some legal exposure. And I think they would um, take that down. And that's something that uh, the company itself could face some legal exposure if they didn't. So providing somebody a Twitter account would essentially, uh, I'm sorry to break a uh, uh, pick mm -hmm. on Twitter, but uh, a, a social media account would actually be constitute material support uh, for ter terrorism. It could be on the right facts. Absolutely, it could be on the right facts. As we were, as I was thinking about this question, I was going to be talking to you today. I was, I was hypothesizing with myself as to whether there might be instances where a uh, media company might be inclined to be taking uh, some entity's content down, but uh, maybe the government was really using it for uh, very productive intelligence purposes. And you might not be able to answer this question. And, and maybe the request would be to not take it down. Are you aware of something like that ever happening? Um, so there isn't a whole lot I can talk about in that area, but you're right that that is a dynamic that um, does play out from, from time to time about um, you know, the, the trade-off between intelligence collection on the one hand versus the uh, interest in uh, deterring the activity on the other. So that's something that we wrestle with sometimes. Thank you. Uh, so your answer kind of let, uh, segued into this next question about this concept of, of material support, uh, which is really one of the key counterterrorism tools that the Justice Department, where you are, has used over the decades uh, to deal with uh, uh, the threat of international uh, terrorism. So let me just ask this question, then we'll turn it, turn it over to Matt. Uh, so just to help educate uh, uh, everyone on, on, our, on our event this afternoon, um, 
the way it works is that if uh, if there's an organization who's on this list, the Foreign Department of Treasury's Foreign Terrorist Organization list, um, and a person writes a hundred dollar check, let's say to a group like Hamas or Hezbollah or ISIS, they violated this law and could face some very stiff uh, criminal penalties. But this law doesn't apply to someone who would write a check of let's say a hundred dollars to uh, uh, the Pr a Proud Boys chapter or the Oath Keepers chapter. Uh, organizations that were involved in the violent attack on the uh, Capitol. Uh, so could you kind of help walk us through and explain why that should be the case that uh, one act of terrorism, if it's by certain or organization, would can be criminalized and others, at least under current law, are not? So the first thing I would say is that uh, the premise of your question, it really depends on the facts, first of all, as to whether that $100 check to Proud Boys could be criminal. Um, in other words, if you send that $100 check and the government can establish that you were doing that with the express purpose of furthering terrorist activity, let's say there was a plot by Proud Boys to uh, build an explosive device and you wanted to contribute to building that explosive device that was gonna be used to uh, you know, attack uh, the Capitol, um, you could be prosecuted under 18 USC 2339A um, for providing material support to terrorists activity when there's a list of crimes and so forth that you could be prosecuted for. What you're talking about, what you're positing in your just hypothetical is... Uh, just so if you did that to Hamas, uh, for Hamas, you wouldn't need to prove that for an international... That's right. That's right. So that's the difference. In other words, let's say you didn't have that scenario. Instead, all you knew that they were contributing to the group because they like the group. They're not, you, can't, you don't have any facts establishing that they, the purpose of the financial donation was to promote any particular crime. And in fact, some terrorist groups have a lot of different purposes. A group like Hamas has uh, activities that are public service oriented, not uh, necessarily terrorism related. Um, so the question there is, you're right that in the international terrorism context, we have a statutory regime that under which the Secretary of State can designate foreign terrorist organizations. And once they're designated, that essentially makes them radioactive. So if you give money to them, then that's a crime. And you're on notice. All we have to all we have to show then is that you knew that it's a that it's a foreign terrorist organization. It doesn't matter whether you try to we're trying to promote any terrorist activity. We don't have a similar statutory regime for domestic any domestic uh, group, and so that's why uh, you could punish one the other and 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 not in the other context. Is because we just don't have that statutory tool. So I guess the more interesting question is why don't we have that statutory? Well, that, that very good. You anticipated uh, 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 my next question exactly. So, what would be the problems if the U.S. created a domestic terrorist organization list run by, let's say, the FBI, not the Department of Treasury? Right. So, um, look, that's something that a lot of people have talked about uh, over the years. Um, I think it would raise a lot of concerns uh, to to have a domestic regime. Um, First of all, there would be constitutional concerns. Um, there is a famous Supreme Court case I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, David, called Brandenburg uh, from 1969 involving the KKK. And in that context, the Supreme Court held that you can't criminalize in, in the domestic context, even advocacy of violence. So th this, these were Klan members, I think in Ohio, who were going to a rally and were advocating, openly advocating violence against the government. And the court held in that case that it was First Amendment protected um, and, the, and that the state of Ohio could not punish uh, that, that speech or that association really with the Klan uh, in that context. Um, so you couldn't, I think consistent with that case law, it, it could be difficult to, uh, to criminalize, let's say membership in the KKK and designate them as a group and say, everyone who's in the KKK is a terrorist and you can be prosecuted for that reason. Move forward, fast forward 40 years to 2010, you have another prominent Supreme Court case, which I'm sure, you, again, you're familiar with David and Matt, uh, Humanitarian Law Project versus Holder. So this is the case involving the FTO statute where a bunch of uh, folks brought suits saying the FTO regime, which I just described, where by support to foreign terrorist organizations is pro prohibited, challenged it on First Amendment grounds. And in that context, it was upheld. And they said that even speech related activities, even activities that some would perceive as innocuous, like training terrorists on how to negotiate peaceful resolution rather than engage in terrorist activity, even that type of support um, could be prohibited under this under the statute. And I think it had a lot to do with the fact that it was a foreign group 
um, and that it was a national security threat coming from outside the United States. Um, so I think there'd be a different constitutional analysis. We, we, we've never had a domestic terrorism statute or regime, so I can't say for certain how the courts would come out in it, on it, but I, I think it, it would raise a lot of issues. It would also raise a host of practical and political problems, which put, putting aside the pure legal issues, um, uh, the material support bar is super broad. So if you were to designate Proud Boys or Atomwaffen or uh, the Klan or something as a domestic terrorist group, anyone who knows a person who's in those groups and provides them any support has just committed a federal crime. And so it, it potentially, you know- Just by buying a t-shirt. Exactly, a hotel that lets those people stay there, just committed material support. A re restaurants that serve them could, could be prosecuted for providing material support, providing that they know them. So there's a good reason, in other words, not to do this because it has ripple effects and collateral consequences that just don't exist for groups that are overseas and uh, don't raise those uh, same concerns. And then last, I think, and perhaps most important, people would be concerned about the potential for abuse of uh, you know uh, the government kind of designating groups that are disfavored in the United States politically for whatever reason and naming them as groups because that's not really uh, consistent with our kind of traditions as a as a society and as a democracy we have the criminal laws here available so that if you're engaging in criminal activity uh, you can be punished we don't generally like to punish just membership or association in particular uh, groups uh, in the United States no matter how noxious their their views might be. So I guess that's a way to answer your question. Well, thanks thanks for that comprehensive answer. Uh, I'm going to flip it over to Matt after I just make one point, which is interesting, is that uh, if you're inside the US, you could even be a US citizen, and you ally or take action in support of an international organization, uh, all of those things do kick, uh, do kick in. Uh, so it is a it is a pretty thorny uh, area deserving of a lot of uh, discussion, just like we did. All right, Matt, please take it on from here. Great, thanks a lot, David. And Brad, thanks so much for joining us today. I've learned a lot from you in our work together. And so it's really thrilling to be able to share your perspective on issues with our students and with our community. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, I got to know you when you were leading negotiations between the US government and the UK government on an agreement that would govern cross-border data requests. So if the UK government, for instance, wanted to make a request of a US company like Facebook or Google or Twitter, there were barriers that stood in the way of companies responding in those situations and you were leading the process to figure out a better way to do that. I'm curious, why was this an issue of interest to the US government um, and what were you hoping to achieve? Right, so um, this has been a project we spent a lot of time on the Department of Justice over the last five years. And I think the easiest way to explain what it's all about is to kind of go back in time and, and, and think about, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, how do we deal with cases in which one government wants to get uh, evidence that's obtained in another country? It didn't happen all that much, uh, uh, but when it did happen, there was a process that was set up called mutual legal assistance, essentially. And so if you had, a, if you had, uh, uh, the United Kingdom had reason to believe that uh, someone had committed a murder in, in the UK and uh, evidence of the crime was in the United States. They would send a request to the United States government to say, hey, we need to get evidence of that crime. We think it's located in this particular location. We would then have to go into a US court, get a search warrant to obtain that information, uh, evaluate it. You know, the, the Brits would have to tell us uh, the information to establish probable cause to obtain the warrant. And then we would take it back and we would turn it over to the British and so forth. So it's a fairly elaborate process. Um, it takes a lot of time, but it, it worked reasonably well because there weren't that many of those and it was only so often that these cross-border requests would come up. So fast forward to the modern era and the internet companies, right? And so now you have the same series of murders in London and they want information. They've already searched the guy's uh, apartment in the UK. They've wiretapped the person's phone um, and they wanna get access to his Gmail account. Um, they have to go through that same process, um, which is the information is located on a server in the United States somewhere. And they've gotta go through that cumbersome MLAT process. They've gotta meet probable cause in the United States. We have to file that process, file for a warrant in the United States to get the access to the, to the, the person's Gmail and send it back to the UK. That process takes months and months. 
in the sheer volume of requests has, as you might imagine, with literally hundreds of millions of subscribers to these services worldwide has made the, the older system essentially collapse <laughs> under the weight of the demands because um, electronic evidence is so critical to so many investigations. And so we at the, Just, at the Justice Department were getting overwhelmed with requests. And we had the UK government and other governments come to us and say, look, we've got to find a better way to do this. There's got to be a better way to do this. And the companies were coming to us because foreign, our foreign government counterparts were getting frustrated that they couldn't get access to evidence they vitally needed. And there really wasn't any US connection. In the older hypo I mentioned, if you're searching someone's house or apartment in the US, um, there was a US connection and the reason for the Fourth Amendment constraints to apply and so forth. When it's just on a server in Seattle, it's accidental that it's here. There's really no real US connection anyway. And so why should US law govern it? Why should the US government be involved? Can we find an easier way where the government, the British government could under its own law, go directly to the company and get the information that it needs? And so that's what this is all about is to set up a structure where we, where we could cut through the legal conflicts and create a new mechanism whereby we could um, have a more efficient, effective way for, for foreign governments and for us when the shoe's on the other foot, when we need to get information abroad from a foreign government to, to have a more effective way of doing it. Um, so, so, I'll, I'll stop droning on, but I'll let you get your next No, no sorry, I, I'd, love to, I'd love to hear you drone more. So you said, could there be an easier way? And yeah. did you find an easier way? Yeah, so what we did, the, the, the real nub of it comes in the conflicts of law. Because so, uh, there are US domestic laws, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which would otherwise foreclose the companies from cooperating with directly with a uh, foreign legal process. And so what we did is create, go, go get a new statute, which we worked hard to get from Congress and we eventually passed called the Cloud Act. And what this statute does is create an exception whereby foreign governments could directly serve process on the companies and the companies would be free to turn over uh, data to, directly to the foreign government if we had a bilateral agreement with the, the, the country. And this is important because not all foreign governments aren't created the same. Maybe we don't want the Chinese government or the Russian government or the Iranian government to be able to serve process on Google and Microsoft and Facebook to get their data because we don't think their legal system is up to par and, and respects privacy in a way that we're comfortable with. And so we need to evaluate the foreign government's legal system and be comfortable with it and also kind of has some rules about how they're gonna deal with the data. We also wanted it not to apply to US citizens because we think if it's a US citizen, we wouldn't want um, them to be targeted. We have to have rules to set all that out and have a framework for how we would address any US person information that might be incidentally collected. And so that's the purpose of these bilateral arrangements. But once you have one of these arrangements, then it would be okay, essentially under the law to go ahead and, and, and fulfill the, the legal demands. So one of the difficult parts of the negotiation was figuring out what is what are the common what's common ground in terms of a human rights foundation for the agreement. Where would you feel comfortable the agreement applying, and where would it not? Where would you not feel comfortable? And I know that was particularly controversial because other governments don't want um, this dictated to them. They don't want to be told that they have to comply with certain norms that are outlined in U.S. law. How do you go about the delicate dance in that process of establishing norms that? companies and human rights NGOs could feel good about and foreign governments would feel good about as well? Yeah, so that's a good question. We, you know, we consulted with um, US NGOs uh, on in developing the Cloud Act and they gave us a lot of good ideas. And so we built a lot of privacy protections into the statute. I can't say that we did everything that all the NGOs wanted because their list would be longer maybe than ours would because we also thought it was important to afford some deference to foreign law and not to try to replicate, for example, everything in US law that, for example, that if they had to meet a probable cause standard, that would defeat kind of the purpose of this. Most other countries around the world don't have a standard as high as probable cause for their equivalent warrants. They have, uh, and for example, most of Europe has what's called a necessary and proportionate standard, which is a little bit different. And our philosophy was, look, the connection to the United States isn't that high anyway. It's only foreign persons. It's only accidental that their, their data is here. As long as it meets kind of baseline norms, and these are European Western democracies with basic commitment to the rule of law and a, and a system that we think is appropriate, then we should afford some deference to their legal system when they're invest, doing investigations that are on their own soil uh, of uh, crimes committed in their countries rather than dictate US norms. At the same time, we wanted to have, again, a floor so that it all seemed uh, stuff that was at least minimally kosher to us. And so that's a balance, and I think it's a balance that we've been able to strike so far. Um, as we evaluate this uh, this process. You alluded in your response there to the discussions you had with NGOs. I'd love to hear a little bit more about 
how the process unfolded from your perspective. I think a lot of people often think that the relationships between companies and governments are either adversarial where the Justice Department is filing you know, an antitrust lawsuit against Google, for instance, or they're sort of uncomfortably cozy, smoke-filled rooms in DC somewhere, people doing backroom negotiations. Um, that's not how I experienced this from the company standpoint. I'm curious about how you went about engaging with companies and then with a broader set of stakeholders as you move forward in the process. So look, it really depends on the setting. Sometimes we are in an adversarial posture with the companies, we're suing them. Other times we're not, we work with them. They, 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 they help us, as I said, in David's part of the uh, setting. There are a lot of the areas in which we have shared interests and common interests. And so we work together when we can and when we can't, but sometimes we're on opposing sides. But you know, we like to have an open door kind of policy where we listen to them and, and, and have productive relationships. And I think we do by and large. I mean, it's not perfect. Sometimes we'll be on opposite sides of issues, but I, that's what we try to do anyway at Justice. And the same thing with the uh, civil rights, civil liberties community. We know we're never gonna be able to, um, to keep them happy with everything that we do because um, uh, we have a different mission than their mission. But we like to listen. We, we have an open door to what they their concerns and listen to their concerns. And if we, we think they have legitimate ones, we'll um, adjust our behavior accordingly. And if we don't, then we'll say thanks very much. But um, we're gonna we're gonna go forward. But we appreciate your views. So we try to c collaborate because I think it's a it's worthwhile in the process to hear different people's perspectives on the whole thing. Um, and that's certainly what we did in this context um, at great length with both the tech sector and the the, the civil society. Yeah, and, and at least it seemed to me that the final result was greatly improved by those consultations, particularly with the NGOs, where I think they had, as you were suggesting, yeah. significant input on the on the human rights factors that were part of the final agreement. They still want, want to do more in, in the statute, but but um, I, I agree with you. I think it yeah, is. That, yeah. they, that just the sign that they're good at their jobs. Yes. Um, <laughs> So I'm curious about where things stand now. So as you described, you know, this process started with the, the on the legislative side with creating the Cloud Act and then moved into executive agreement and negotiations with the UK government. How have things unfolded since then? And, and I'm also kind of curious if you would assess this as a success. Has this worked the way that you were hoping it would work? Well, like many things in government, it's taken longer to get off the ground for reasons I won't go into, but we do have an agreement with the UK we put, put it forth before Congress. There was a kind of six month waiting period uh, that it, under the statute that it has to wait in, uh, to see if there were any congressional concerns before it can enter into force. That period expired last year. We haven't yet had the UK agreement enter in force for kind of complicated reasons, which kind of relate to um, other issues going on with Europe and privacy, um, but we're poised to do that. And so we have kind of a, a, a agreement all in place with the UK. We're moving on. I think it's public that um, we're working on an agreement with Australia. Uh, so our other Five Eyes partners are probably in the queue. Um, and then we'll, we'll move on from there because we really want this to be a framework and a model for things that we can do with a lot of countries. And there's been a lot of interest from different countries around the world in having these agreements. And so we hope it'll be a framework for kind of more efficient exchange of data and law enforcement investigations um, for a bunch of countries. And so that's our, our plan. But it is pretty laborious to get into the details of how all this works with each country. Mm -hmm. Um, so you alluded to some of the discussions with the with Europe around around privacy issues. I know that you've been active in the so-called Schrems II case, um, which has to do with data transfers between Europe and the United States or U.S. companies that are that are based in the U.S. Um, I'm curious again, what is the U.S. government's issue uh, uh, interest in this issue? It seems like it's an issue between European governments and U.S. tech companies. Why is the U.S. government getting involved? Yeah, so we get involved because we care about U.S. tech companies. Um, we care about transatlantic commerce, and the Schrems II decision has a huge, potentially huge impact on transatlantic commerce. Maybe I'll just take a second to explain what the Schrems II decision was basically about. This is a decision, um, it was a case brought by uh, an Austrian privacy activist named Max Schrems, who basically said, uh, in summary, uh, it's inconsistent with EU privacy law for Facebook to transfer my data to the United States because the US intelligence community can access that data there in a way that we that I, Max Schrems, don't think is consistent with European privacy standards. So US surveillance law, he said, is incompatible with EU privacy standards and therefore the data can't be transferred to the United States. So he brought two rounds of litigation in courts in the European Union. And then the most recent one, the Schrems II decision, the highest court in Europe, the European Court of Justice, agreed with Schrems and said, yeah, you know, I've looked at US law and I find it lacking. 
And so it is uh, incompatible with European law for uh, for Schrems's data to be transferred, for Facebook to transfer Schrems's data to the United States. Um, and so this is a huge issue because it's not just Facebook. There are literally thousands of companies, both in the, both U.S. companies and European companies, that are sending data back and forth between Europe and the United States all the time. So it's a massive issue that affects uh, transatlantic commerce. If they can't uh, transfer data back and forth, uh, commerce will be grossly affected. Uh, it could result in what we call data localization within Europe, which means they're going to all have to shelter and keep all their data in place in Europe, which is really just not practical for a lot of companies. And so it's an issue that we in the US government are keenly interested in resolving so that uh, European uh, transatlantic commerce is, is not undermined uh, fundamentally. And, and the reason good. why we why we feel responsible is the nub of the issue is, is US surveillance law. And that's why it's a national security issue is this underlying concern is about our collection under FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or under our broader uh, constitutional authority to collect intelligence under Executive Order 12333. Could you guys just give one quick example of the kind of data transfer you're actually talking about? So uh, Facebook, if you have a Facebook account, your data might be transferred to Facebook just for uh, to, uh, their offices in San Francisco for processing Right, just yeah. as part of Facebook's, Mac might be able to explain it better than me, um, yeah. uh, why Facebook needs to transfer data to the United States. Yeah, I mean, Facebook's network is entirely in mesh. So if you're a European user and you post a photo and an American user comments on it or the reverse, that could be European data transferred to the United States in a circumstance like that. And that's the kind of thing that happens at, Brad, Brad you were talking previously about the kind of new scale of tech companies. That's the kind of thing that happens probably billions of times a day. Right. Yeah. Or even if you're Ford Motor Company, you're not a tech company, and you're you have your HR data of your employees, and your HR center is in you know Topeka, Kansas, then you're sending your HR data there, and you your employees in Europe, their data is going there. So that's that's a great point. We actually talked to my class on Monday night about whether Ford was a was a tech company now, um, and then I think Monday earlier in the day they announced that they'd be using Android software in their cars, which kind of brings the brings the issue to the fore. You, you mentioned in talking about it that it's not just big tech companies um, that are that are involved. You mentioned Ford is one, you know, one possible co additional company that would be affected. W what are others? Like how, how pervasive is this issue? Um, I mean, clearly, I, I do think people think it's just, you know, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple issue. It's clearly broader than that. Who, who do you, who else do you have in mind? It could be any company, healthcare yeah. companies that are transferring healthcare data, which are, that's one of the concerns, particularly during COVID. Right. There's information that they need to transfer back and forth for their own purposes and that that could be adversely affected. Mm -hmm. uh, financial companies, investment issues, it, it runs the whole, the whole gamut of the economy. Mm -hmm. So that's so, why it's such an important issue. So your office at the Justice Department um, uh, author drafted a paper that's pretty detailed on components of the US surveillance regime What's the first of all? What's what's in the paper? What is that? What are the points that you're trying to make there? And then, what's the value of this type of work product? Right. So the purpose of this paper. So to take a step back, the European Court of Justice identified kind of very specific defects in U.S. law. So under what's called I won't get into all the details, but what's called Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which is something that authorizes us to collect information on non-U.S. persons outside the United States. And they said that that was not necessary and proportionate collection under EU law, and there wasn't enough independent review of how that uh, collection is conducted. Um, they also faulted our collection under Executive Order 12333, which is kind of our, again, our, our um, collection against uh, foreign nationals outside the United States, where it's not compulsory, you're not going to a company and collecting it, but you're doing it through unilateral means. And they said that, particularly in bulk, is not adequately constrained um, uh, under EU law. Important to note, um, our perspective is most European member states have much the same collection activities as the United States does, uh, and yet they are not being criticized by the European Court of Justice. They're not; they're beyond the scope of jurisdiction. Even is what we're being told by our European counterparts is it's not within their purview to review even the same intelligence collection practices that are engaged in by Germany, France, Italy, etc. Um, but the United States, because of this, the quirk of U uh, EU law is subject to their review. So that's obviously not something we find terribly um, satisfactory. Um, so the purpose of the white paper was essentially to 
arm companies, or at least to provide arguments that they could make in response to the SHREMS decision as to why, um, notwithstanding the court's judgment, there are adequate protections, privacy protections in US law that either occurred after the SHREMS decision came into effect and so weren't taken into account or um, were overlooked and really not addressed in the court's opinion so that the, court, so that the companies have an argument that they can make if they're confronted by uh, European regulators who say, look, under the SHREMS decision, you're not allowed to do this because the one silver lining of the SHREMS decision was that it said, companies have to make a case-by-case -case evaluation as to whether they can transfer data in the absence of a, what's called an adequacy finding. And so in order to fulfill that obligation, we're providing them information so the companies can make their judgments as the court instructed them to do on a case-by-case -case basis as to whether US law is adequate. So we're giving them some information that they might know about otherwise uh, arcane US law so that they can make their arguments to, uh, to the European regulators. Where does this issue uh, stand now and what's, what's happening next and what's the ongoing role of the US government gonna be? So we are now uh, negotiating or we're in discussions with the European Commission about whether what steps we can take to get a renewed adequacy finding. That was what was struck down by the court in Schrems, which is a finding that US law is adequate, such that data can flow back and forth. And so now we'd like to, we'd like to get a new adequacy finding that we hope will withstand scrutiny by the, from the ECJ. And so we're thinking about what changes or adjustments we can make in US law to essentially get back in the good graces of uh, the, uh, the uh, European courts and have that finding, which will no doubt be challenged again, whatever we do, and hopefully we'll withstand scrutiny the next time. So that's, that's where we are now is, is working with the um, Europeans to see if we can, um, can, can uh, come to an agreement. Great. David, should we uh, turn it over to, to student questions or do you have any others you'd like to ask? That would be great. Uh, folks should uh, chat Robert Carlson on Bo Carlson on the, uh, the chat function if you have uh, questions. Uh, let me make a couple of announcements before we uh, turn to that. Uh, so uh, next week, a week from today on February 10th, uh, we're gonna be hosting Ben Witties of uh, Lawfare. I don't know, uh, if students, those of you in kind of follow national security law, lawfare is like one of the premier uh, blogs, websites, uh, didn't even exist seven or eight years ago, but it's a great place to go to uh, see a lot of discussion about the kinds of things we're talking about today and the full range of national security law issues. And we'll have the, the founder of that site uh, here to talk with David Hoffman on a, additional tech and policy issues. There's really no shortage of them. We'll, uh, not even just scratch the surface today. So that's next Wednesday, February 10th. Uh, the following Monday, uh, February 15th, we're going to have an event on uh, women in national security with uh, many of our uh, AGS alumni, some of our national security uh, fellows. Uh, this year we have seven fellows and five of them are women. So that's a, a, a great resource uh, for us. Uh, and they'll be talking about uh, both uh, their careers, uh, the opportunities that are available uh, in national security, of course, some of the, the challenges uh, uh, that they have faced. Uh, two weeks from today, on Wednesday, uh, February 17th, we will have uh, Kim Gaddis, who's an award-winning journalist and author, talking about the Iran-Saudi Arabia relationship and its impact uh, on the Middle East. Uh, that, of course, is a fascinating topic, and we're really, I've heard, I haven't read the book, uh, and I intend to, but she, I, I've heard it's a fantastic book, and I can't wait to read it and hear what she has to say uh, two weeks from now. Of course, we have more events uh, coming up throughout the year. You can check it out on the AGS uh, website uh, for our calendar of events. And uh, let's turn to our first uh, questioner, and that is going to be um, Gerardo Gomez. Gerardo. Yeah, uh, hi, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wigman, for coming here to speak. It's been very, very interesting to hear your perspective on these issues. So I have this debate with my parents all the time, and it's pretty much uh, considering that the US has hundreds of smartphones from domestic terror attacks, what are some of the ethical and legal boundaries of having a company like Apple or Samsung create an algorithm that can unlock those phones from a government perspective? Are you talking about some phones that where there's suspected evidence of a crime that uh, the FBI believes might be 
on the phone and the question is uh can the government get the company's help unlocking the phone so they get access to that evidence is that the question gerardo yeah what are the ethical and legal uh sure. difficulties with that yeah so that's a good question it goes to essentially the en encryption debate or what we at, at doj call the lawful access issue you know I'll just tell you my own view, and I think it's one that Department of Justice has held and the FBI has held across administrations, um, but I know it's super controversial, is that, look, there's not really a difference between a, a cell phone and your house or your, even something super, your suitcase, your underwear drawer. Once a judge has found that there's probable cause to believe that there's been criminal activity and that the place to be searched contains evidence of that criminal activity, it's important for us as a society to be able to get access to that place, whether it's your house, which we clearly can do, uh, whether it's your suitcase, or whether it's your cell phone. And I don't think cell phones or laptops should have any different or privileged status that other places don't have, um, because it's it would actually be dangerous to have it any other way, because otherwise you're creating essentially safe spaces where terrorists and um, pedophiles, human traffickers, cyber criminals, transnational organized crime can use a network um, with uh, impunity that they could not be discovered by the government because they have a place that the government can't penetrate even if they have a warrant uh, to get access to it. So. Uh, I know this is controversial because I think a lot of privacy advocates say, no, we, people should have ability to communicate in private and not know, um, ha not have the government be able to get access. And I get they should be able to, uh, to communicate in private, but not where the government has a warrant uh, to, to get access to their communications. And we obviously have had wiretaps on phones for many years, uh, for regular phones, and have had that for centuries. I mean, since phones were created, obviously not for centuries, but for decades. And um, I don't see why the new changes in technology change that, that balance. But um, I know a lot of people in the privacy community and the, and the tech sector uh, disagree with that fundamentally. And so that's a debate that we are having and continuing to have. But um, the US government isn't alone on this issue. There's a number of um, the Five Eyes governments have all issued statements on this. I think the European Union is coming around on this issue. So um, we'll, see, we'll see where it goes. Well, let me press your analogy just a little bit further. So if you had a house, let's say it had a super kryptonite lock on it and the government is having trouble breaking through the, the door, couldn't use the usual you know, battering ram to get through the door. Uh, what, your, what the government's position is, is that the company that makes the lock, and they're not, they're not in the business of breaking open locks, they're in the business of actually making locks that are really secure that their uh, customers really want. Uh, that somehow the, the lock making company should essentially create some sort of new product or some sort of way for uh, uh, to undo uh, this great kryptonite uh, lock so the government can get into this house. And, and you're saying that the government should be able to force the lock making company to create that product, the unlock product. And that's uh, one of the arguments about what the, the, the companies don't think they should be compelled to essentially create a, a product that undoes an important feature of their phones, which is encryption that people like and want to buy. They're not in the business of creating un unencryption products. They're in the business of creating phones that people want to use. Yeah, so I would take, I would say exactly that. Yes, we do want the companies to have to be able to do that. Imagine if you're, you're living on the street and you go, your kid wanders down the street and disappears into that house with that lock and your kid is in there and you, you people, the neighbors saw the kid go into the house and unfortunately there's a lock on Except that result that I'm sorry, your child disappeared. There's nothing that can be done. There's just nothing that the, the government can do. They can't get in the house. There's no warrant that would allow them to go in there. Um, you're just, it's uh, too bad for you. That's essentially what the tech companies are saying with respect to, let's say, child exploitation activity that is going on online, where we the government has no ability to uh, access those communications. So yeah, I would I would I would take that example, and I would say there's precedent for it. Certainly in the wiretap context, we have for many years required phone companies, ordinary phone companies, to have the capability to uh, allow the government to wiretap phones. They're in, they're not in the business 
uh, of uh, they're in the business of facilitating phone communications, not uh, to help the government, but the Congress passed a law that says, look, you have an obligation as a company in our society to, to create the ability to cooperate with government demands. And so we've done this in other contexts, and so it would not be novel. Okay, I could take this analogy one step further, but I think we want to get to other uh, questioners. Uh, let's see, we have uh, Rachel Pfeiffer. I think this will be a question that's being read. Thank you, Professor Shanzer. So Rachel Pfeiffer has a question, um, and then I'll be reading that, and we'll have a series of audience questions after that. Um, so the question is, could a comprehensive US privacy law sufficiently satisfy uh, concerns from the European Court of Justice? Um, so I know there's a debate about having a, a new privacy law in the US. I'm not sure that it would necessarily address the concerns of the Court of Justice in Schrems because those were very focused on US national security collection activities. And so it's really about adjusting how, uh, how those activities operate more so than a generalized privacy law that, that isn't focused on our national security authority. So I, um, I, think they, I think the Europeans would welcome such a law, but I don't think it would get us all the way there. Okay, Peter Connolly. Thank you again for coming and speaking to us today. My question is, um, as foreign adversaries uh, increasingly develop their offensive cyber capabilities, how do you ensure that U.S. companies um, have the adequate defenses to protect our data and also um, enough protections to not destabilize the economy? And then how do you um, how do you kind of respond to those cyber attacks like the one that just occurred uh, to the U.S. government in a proportional manner that doesn't uh, escalate the attacks, but uh, deters future ones? I'm sorry if I heard your first question. How do we how do we ensure that um, companies uh, protect their have adequate cybersecurity? Is that the first question? I think it was. So look, we, we haven't had a, uh, we, we just talked about mandates on companies. We don't have a law in, in the country that mandates um, best practices for cybersecurity. Um, but we certainly try to help companies, particularly our critical, critical infrastructure companies to improve their cybersecurity. Um, so I'm talking about the power grid and you know state and local governments and the energy companies and all of that kind of stuff, um, where I know the Department of Homeland Security is working actively with those uh, companies in that sector all the time to promote cybersecurity. It's obviously in their interest um, uh, to do that. So it is something that the federal government has an active program to do in addition to promoting its uh, cybersecurity in its, in its own networks. Um, your second question was about cyber response. Is that right? I'm, I'm sorry. Peter, can you repeat the second? Uh, yeah, my, uh, my second question was on kind of on the cyber attacks that just occurred. How do you kind of deter those future attacks and respond in a proportionate manner without escalating them? Yeah, so um, it's very tricky. I mean, the, the recent attacks that you're talking about were kind of classic espionage. Um, and uh, it, it's a very it's a very sensitive issue because um, the all governments engage in espionage, um, and so we want to build our defenses. But in terms of what might be an appropriate uh, kind of counter response, we have to keep keep that in mind. And there are, there are norms essentially of government behavior, um, and so there's a difference between let's say a cyber attack that is um, aimed at undermining your power grid versus something that's stealing information. And so that will affect what kind of response you think is appropriate. But you know, look, the, the main thing is to, to try to build defenses, um, to try to um, understand what the scope of the um, attack is in terms of what information was obtained. And um, in terms of deterrence, we certainly have brought some criminal cases here at, at a DOJ uh, against actors, but that, that only goes so far if we can't obtain custody of the individual. So, um, there are some cyber um, response activities, offensive cyber capabilities that um, we maintain. I can't talk a lot about those, but those are things that can also be brought to bear um, when appropriate. But again, we have to take into account what the facts are of the, 
of the intrusion before we decided whether and how to employ those. So let me recommend a, a great book, uh, David Sanger, The Perfect Weapon, uh, which really gets into the emerging field of cybersecurity and this whole, uh, and cyber warfare and this whole question of how do you uh, deter what are proportionate responses, what are the risks if you do respond and, and so on. So it's a, it's a great book. Okay, next question, uh, Gia DeHart. Thanks, Professor. I was asked by the Q&A moderator to define some of the terms in my question. So I have a question about the GIF-CT, which is the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism, a group of tech companies seeking to remove um, online extremist content. And my question is about their hash sharing consortium, which essentially assigns a digital fingerprint to remove content and then shares that fingerprint with other tech companies to prevent its upload. Um, but even if the content is altered by a second, the extremists can bypass that and still upload their content. So my question is, should the GIF-CT consider a digital locker to allow this content to be archived? And if so, how could that information be shared with the US government and our partners? In terms of, I'm thinking more intelligence analysts, intelligence analysis, not um, for prosecution. Is this something you've had a chance to deal with, Brad, or is that, uh, uh outside your bailiwick. I don't, maybe the questioner could tell me what, what that means exactly in terms of a digital locker. I'm not familiar with it. Gia, what's a digital oh, locker? So um, essentially the GIF CT removes the extremist content, but once it's removed, they don't store it. Like the content itself is not stored. It assigns a digital fingerprint, like a, a code to that specific content. And it resulted in a lot of war crimes being lost specifically in Syria. So I guess I'm wondering, would, would the government be interested in the GIF-CT archiving this actual content so that we can analyze it and understand how extremists recruit and work together and then incorporate that in our own intelligence work? I see. So the idea is just, can we, uh, if the if the company is going to be taking down content, shouldn't they store it somewhere so that we can exploit it for intelligence purposes? Is basically what you're saying. Yes. Sounds good to me. <laughs> I don't know. It sounds like an interesting uh, an interesting idea. I don't know what the constraints on it would be or what they're doing exactly, but sure, we you know we would love to be able to cooperate with them if it's something that's. Uh, lawful and something we could do. Um, so it sounds like- All right, do you have any light in your uh, study? Cause we've kind of, as, as it's gotten darker, we were losing you. Yeah, okay, should I should I turn the light on? Is yeah, turn it on. Uh, we're okay. uh, open, you know, we're all for transparency here. Uh, okay, next question comes from uh, Ash. Javeri. Hi, how are you? Uh, thank you so much for coming um, and speaking with us. I've been had an awesome time. My, my question was regarding the solar winds hack. Um, I just like to get kind of your, your, your take on it and like, um, kind of what it means for the U S that so like so many, uh, companies and also, uh, executive agencies were affected. Um, and, and kind of what that says about the U S cybersecurity infrastructure. Um, and, and also kind of how Biden might be different in dealing with, with this particular incident and maybe, you know, future incidents uh, and how he, how he differs from Trump in that regards. So let me just say right up front, I, I haven't been working on the solar winds thing, so I can't really comment uh, much in detail on it specifically other than what I said earlier about the nature of the problem. But obviously it's, it, it's just a truism to say it's deeply, deeply troubling um, that, the, uh, that they were able to exploit um, you know, the, the software to get access to so much information um, and a deeply damaging, um, uh, you know, act of espionage. So anytime you have an episode like this, there's a lot of um, soul searching in the government about what we can do better um, to try to protect, uh, you know, government networks and other networks. And so there's a lot of that work is going to be going on. Um, I think it would be going on if I started in the Trump administration, be going on the Biden administration. Um, I'm not sure it's a partisan issue one way or the other on something like this. I think um, either administration would be, um, you know, keenly interested in seeing what we could do to try to prevent something like this from occurring again. Okay, Grayson. 
All right. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. I have more a general question, and that is, it seems to me that overall, as technology advances exponentially, we're desperately trying to develop and sustain methods of security and privacy. And so I wonder if that reactive approach is perpetual, or is it possible to ever be proactive, or at least be more proactive than reactive? So that's a very thoughtful question, and I agree with you. We are largely reactive and largely even slow to react, uh, at least in terms of public policy, because uh, Washington and Congress and the executive branch is um, overwhelmed with issues and it's the issue of the day. Let's say solar winds occurs and then people are responding to that problem or 9-11 occurs and people are responding to that crisis. Um, and that's what we do uh, as a government. It would be good if we could be proactive and get ahead of these things. I think we aspire to do that in government, um, but I don't think we often achieve it because the immediate concern pushes off the, the next crisis um, uh, or the, the, that's over the horizon that, that hasn't occurred yet. So I guess to answer your question, I wish we could. Uh, we try to, but I, I, I don't think we often do. Okay, our next question comes from Charlotte Kaiser. Great, and I'll be reading the question from Charlotte Kaiser. Um, so she asks, in the face of SHRMS 2 um, and after SHRMS 1, how can the US and the EU move on from siloed country approaches to develop more subsidive and stable mechanisms for data secure sovereignty across borders? So this is a topic that you've already described, um, but she's curious about frameworks like Safe Harbor, like Privacy Shield, um, or something global, would that function better? Yeah, so it's a good question. We, you know, we're working, as I said earlier, to try to get a new framework for US adequacy uh, so that the US will be data adequate. But even apart from that, I think what the US government wants to do to try to resolve these debates so that we don't have so much friction on the trade-offs between privacy and national security going forward is to get like-minded um, nations together, the, the Western democracies and other democracies around the world, and say, look, we all have needs to collect intelligence to protect our national security. We all have needs to collect information for law enforcement purposes, but we also all care about privacy deeply. Um, we, we address it in different ways, but we wanna protect the privacy and civil liberties interests of our citizens. How do we square those principles? What is a, a baseline set of norms that we can all agree is acceptable at some level that where we know it's not gonna be identical um, between different countries, as I talked about earlier, the philosophy underlying the Cloud Act is to afford some deference to other countries' uh, laws in this regard. And so what we wanna do is get to a place where the Europeans and the United States and countries like Canada and Japan and other major democracies around the world can come to a recognition of what are baseline principles in this area. And once we have that, hope to kind of afford you know, mutual recognition and not have so much um, friction over uh, the privacy security trade-off. Okay, uh, let's see. We're going to turn to uh, Sam Reynoldson. Uh, hello, thank you, Mr. Wiegman, uh, for sharing some of your expertise with us tonight. The question that I have is that recently, this week, I read an article in the New York Times published on Sunday about um, the Trump administration's focus on left-wing extremist threats rather than right-wing extremist threats. I know that you work in the Department of Justice and have for a long time. A quote from this article is that, is quote, White House and Justice Department officials stifled internal efforts to publicly promote concerns about the far-right threat. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Do you concur with that statement? And what is your experience with that happening? So I don't wanna comment on that article specifically, but what I would say is what we try to do at DOJ and at FBI is to get beyond kind of labels of right wing and left wing and focusing on a certain you know Antifa versus the Proud Boys or the Klan or sovereign citizen uh, groups. Look, the career, for the career people at FBI and DOJ, we're, we're all about trying to protect people from any violence. It doesn't matter what the group is, but if it's a, it's, if it's a group that's espousing violence then, uh, or, or, or plotting violence, 
we want to stop it, whether it's in a, a, a radical environmental uh, group, uh, a, a, uh, an anarchist group, a white supremacist group, any of those groups. And so we don't even like the labels of right wing and left wing, because I think those labels for people who are on the right end of the spectrum, they don't like to be associated with the right wing groups because they're on the right and they don't agree with that ideology. The same thing on the left. They don't want to be, if it's a left wing, so-called left wing terrorist group, they don't want it to be called left wing because they may share some ideas of that group and not uh, commit to the violence that they espouse. So uh, I think what's most important is to, to focus on all the threats. And I think that's what FBI has done. They don't, some of it is not in the spotlight, but you'll see a lot of investigations and prosecutions of individuals on both sides, um, uh, regardless of whatever rhetoric you might see coming out from other parts of, of, of the administration. Um, that's certainly been the FBI's focus. Let me follow up uh, on that a little bit. So Brad, uh, after 9-11, of course, we passed the Patriot Act, which led to a lot of different uh, innovations, some of which the European Court of Justice didn't like in terms of foreign intelligence uh, collection uh, and so on, uh, which were essentially new tools to deal with the threat that was revealed by 9-11. Do we need uh, new tools at all to deal with the threat of, uh, of domestic terrorism? Uh, do we have the you know, capabilities and the authorities we need to do the kinds of surveillance uh, of, of these groups that you know, presented definitely a, a threat on the order of magnitude that we hadn't seen for quite a while on the 6th of January? Yeah. So that's one of the things we're looking at right now with the new administration. I think understandably in light of the events at the, at the Capitol, uh, as well as recent, uh, other recent uh, terrorist attacks over the last couple of years, uh, the new administration is coming in and saying, look, we need to reevaluate re what we're doing in a domestic terrorism space. Do we have all the authorities that we need? Do we have the information sharing that we need? Um, what about the international dimensions um, to this uh, problem? Is there something more that we should be done to address those? Um, how are we working with the tech sector um, to address uh, uh, domestic radicalization online? All, all of those issues are things that we're currently looking at. And included in that is whether we would need a new like domestic terrorism statute. And that's something a lot of people have written about because we don't have a, a statute focused uniquely on domestic terrorism. Um, we, on that front, I would say, look, we, we we can't point to a lot of domestic terrorists that we've been unable to prosecute because of a lack of authorities. It's not like we have, here's 10 or 15 cases where our, our, the bad guy got away because we didn't have a statute we could prosecute them with that, that carried an adequate penalty. We just don't have those as of today. Yet that having been said, I could also see some value in having some, some kind of hortatory and symbolic value in having a, a crime be designated as domestic terrorism. It could help us predicate investigations as well. So. You know, that's a debate that we'll have. Um, I know people have different views on it as to whether the, such a statute might be abused or not. So it depends on how you craft it and what it might look like. So it's certainly something we will um, be thinking about. Just so that that word didn't slip by our viewers, when you say, you know, uh, if you have this, uh, some sort of new statute, new law, uh, that gives you an opportunity to what you call predicate, essentially yeah. open uh, an investigation if uh, under these authorities where you might not. And also that can form the basis if you have probable cause uh, that, that that law has been violated to, to get a warrant to do more surveillance. So the, diff the whatever the authorities are can affect what you can investigate and what kinds of uh, surveillance you can do as well. Is that, that what you were getting at? Yeah, that's right. But, but just to be clear, we do have a lot of laws that we use Absolutely. already uh, in these cases. Fire. Um, so on, yeah. Exactly. You know, attacks on federal buildings or federal officials, or, you know, there's a whole range of things. Hate crimes. We have the all the hate crimes. Is what, the, yeah, the question is, what are there things that can help you get to, you know, before the boom a little bit yeah. more? Whereas yeah. the explosives law, we tend to find out about, you know, and gun violations, we tend to find out about yeah. it after we've after the fact or after we, you know, reveal the cache of weapons. Mm -hmm. And the question is whether you can somehow get to, you know, people a little earlier. And that was the whole issue in 9-11 as well, kind of a preventive approach as opposed to a prosecutorial after the after the fact. All right, we yeah, have- so, so on that front, it'd be a question of whether you can have some kind of preparatory acts of, uh, offense, which is getting, you know, you, you run into ultimately the issues about how early in the kind of thought process can you get at someone when they haven't yet committed to criminal activity, but they're engaged in these preparatory steps. 
and there's kind of some constitutional issues underlying that. But look, we can we could examine whether you can go earlier in the process to try to uh, nip uh, that conduct in the bud. So. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. We'll go to Ed Hines. Great, this question from Ed Hines. Um, he mentions there are laws about slander and hate speech that apply to print and broadcast media. So are those laws applicable on social media? And what makes social media different where maybe those laws can't govern that space? I'm not, I'm not sure if I understand the question exactly. He says laws about hate speech uh, and sure if reliable. What's so, that? As I understand, the libel, the libel laws apply to um, you know you could be sued for libel for something that uh, somebody says about you on social media, as opposed to you know in a speech or in the newspaper. I mean, I'm I don't I'm not aware of any differences there. No. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sarah Scanlon. So um, Sarah, it looks like was unable to join the call. So I'll put on Ramesh. Okay. If you're ready. Hi, uh, this is Ramesh. Um, my question is: uh, Is the government taking any uh, a, a position on the uh, private crypto networks that are possible channels for? Uh, financing for domestic terrorism. Thank you. Cryptocurrency. Oh, cryptocurrency. Yeah. Uh, crypto, crypto networks and the cryptocurrencies are, um, you know, uh, transfer vehicles, right? Uh, but there are private distributed crypto networks that have been created, um, in other words, a huge proliferation of them. I was, I'm very curious about is the government, I mean, traditionally the government has been tracking payment networks um, over the years, decades, in fact, from SWIFT to the more modern ones. I'm very curious about um, where the government stands today, at least is aware about in terms of the proliferation of these new types of networks which are all heavy on crypto. Uh, in yeah, terms I think of he's got it. Why don't you let Brad uh, yeah. try to answer? Yeah. So if he means encrypted communication platforms, whereby they can exchange views and information and conspire and plot, it brings me back to the earlier debate we were having just about encryption and lawful access. So domestic terrorism is a prime example of a way in which people can exploit um, encrypted communications platforms to engage in really dangerous and negative uh, social behavior free from uh, the fear of government intrusion. So yes, it raises the same uh, lawful access issues that I was mentioning in response to an earlier question where the government would very much like to uh, get to a world in which with a warrant, uh, with appropriate due process, we could um, gain access to those uh, communications as appropriate to try to prevent uh, domestic terrorist attacks. I don't know that, how to you had a uh, had a question you wanted to kind of uh, use to finish finish us off this evening. Um, to pose, Brad. Yeah, I'd love to ask what advice you have for Duke students who are interested in the career in, in this career. Um, well, I guess my advice would be uh, work hard, <laughs> uh, get good grades. There's a lot of people who want to work in national security or in government, and so it's not necessarily easy. But if you show an interest. I think it helps if you're applying for jobs to do the, do internships, try to get internships with agencies because it shows an interest, you know, work on journals um, at, at, your, at school that are focused on this area. Um, Cause I think demonstrated interest is, is also as important as, you know, how you're doing in school. And, um, and, and look, I would encourage people to do it because it's, for me, it's been a great career. I've really enjoyed working government. They're fascinating issues. It's, um, it's good to feel like you're doing something useful and important, and uh, it's always it's never been dull. And um, you don't make as much money as you do in a fancy uh, Wall Street job, but um, it has its own rewards. So I would encourage people if they're interested to um, to pursue it. And certainly, I'm happy to help any uh, Duke student. I'm a Duke grad myself, and so I'm always on the lookout for anyone from Duke. Um, if I can help you in any way, uh, let me know. 
was there anything about your Duke experience that resulted or kind of led you to the career that you, you've had uh, with all these different agencies and dealing with these national security issues? Well, I wish I could say yes, but um, <laughs> when I was graduating college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was one of the kids that just drifted on into law school after I was uh, an undergrad. And, I, I, and then I went to a law firm and I actually, my own career path isn't a very good example of how to get into national security because it was only fortuitous really that I, I kind of fell into it when a partner at my law firm um, you know, went to the Department of Defense and I kind of uh, followed him over there where I, I met David and, and started working with him when he was also uh, there. But um, so it depends. And, and so people have different ways to, uh, that they fall into different things, but I've certainly enjoyed it. So I would I definitely encourage people if they're interested in this area that to, uh, to work in it. And we, and we welcome, we need, we need new um, smart um, young people to work. And I'm thrilled that we, we do have a lot of them uh, coming in. And so I, I hope we uh, keep the pipeline coming. Yeah, in the back in ancient history, though, when you, we went to law school, there really wasn't this field of national security law and a set of courses and blogs and and uh, you know big positions that in both the public and private sector. You know, imagine all these issues that the tech companies are dealing with. They need really good lawyers to work on, whether it's the Schrems two or content regulation or uh, uh, things of that nature. So. Uh, there are loads of opportunities, both in policy and, and, and legal policy uh, issues. Well, uh, thank you so much, Brad. Uh, boy, we had a tremendous turnout. You can see the student interest in these topics uh, stimulated by the kinds of courses uh, Matt and I and many of our other faculty are, are, are offering now uh, in this area. So uh, it was incredibly uh, timely. Um, you know, we're, we're not allowed to, you know, since with COVID, we can't have you at Duke for a nice dinner. And, and uh, since you're a public servant, you can't take a, the, the huge honoraria that we uh, provide for our speakers. Well, not really, but uh, we can offer you this uh, coming in the mail soon is this Duke American Grand Strategy Program t-shirt. You'll want to wear that at the DOJ gym when you bump into Merrick Garland and and uh, all the incoming uh, people in the Biden administration. Uh, many, many people uh, from the Department of Justice, uh, Lisa Monaco, in fact, they're gonna hope, uh, once confirmed to be the deputy uh, AG. She has one of these t-shirts and, and now you will wow. too. So that's pretty cool. Well, Lisa uh, and I can get together and with our t-shirts and we'll have a cookout or something. So that'll be great. Uh, socially distant, masked and, and so on. So. Uh, so we're thrilled. We can't thank you enough and been a real inspiration uh, to all of our students and so knowledgeable. And um, many thanks. And hopefully next time we'll be able to have you on campus and, and take in a basketball game. How's that? Well, thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate it. I hope it wasn't too boring for your um, <laughs> students today. And I'm only disappointed I didn't get any Duke basketball questions because that's what I I, that probably people would find that more interesting and fun to talk about. Uh, though I'm happy to stay on if people want to talk. Uh, we'll about stay on. We're trying to work together at the Department of Defense in a suite of windowless offices with, yeah. uh, you know, that was one big giant safe. Uh, you always knew Duke lost if the door was closed and there was a black flag outside and, yeah. and he was in a really bad mood because this was the serious, first serious Duke basketball fan I ever really came across. And then yeah. and who knew my office would be just a couple hundred yards from the Temple of Basketball uh, at <laughs> Indoor Stadium. But that's just uh, the way things go. You never know. Do you go uh, to a lot of games yourself, David, or no? Uh, I'm way too far down on the totem pole to uh, get tickets. Is that right? Uh, so, uh, uh, every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we're adjourned for this evening. Please join us for our events next week. And please join me in uh, giving a virtual thank you to Brad Wigman. Thanks very much. All right, we're adjourned.